Awesome. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Michael Pleasant with OpenSecurity.io. Um, so in today's Fresh Perspective, um, basically what we're talking about, we were just talking about a ton before, is what we've been doing in the meantime um, during this crisis, the at-home crisis, if you will. Um, so, you know, how have you, what has this made a difference to your company? Has it, um, and, you know, really what are you doing to uh, find sanity at this, at this time? Maybe, sorry, I, I realize it's kind of a short intro to who you are, but if you could yeah, also maybe give us uh, a little bit of background on, on who you are and um, sure. what you do. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, it's always good to talk to you. You and I hang out and talk a lot kind of outside of this anyway. So we're going to probably spend the next hour just chatting as normal anyway. So, yeah. um, But my name is Michael Pleasant. I am the CEO and founder of Open Security, which is a San Antonio-based cybersecurity firm. We offer various levels of services to small and large businesses, products, and consultation, essentially just trying to make sense of what cybersecurity means for any one of our clients. And so what's really interesting now, currently with the COVID-19 crisis, is how people are reacting to cybersecurity. So um, to your question about what we've been doing, um, there are a bunch of different ways that our clients and businesses here in Texas and also elsewhere have responded to COVID. And really it, it depends on the priorities of the business and how the business has affected or how, how the uh, COVID has affected their business and their bottom line because if you're a business who is struggling to pay the bills, keep the lights on, pay your employees, if those are your major concerns, or even just putting food on the table at home or having toilet paper at home, like if those are your concerns, cybersecurity isn't as important anymore. Cybersecurity just becomes less of a priority then because there are more tangible things that you can see and feel that suddenly matter a lot more. Um, the, the unfortunate reality though is that while putting food on the table and, and taking care of your family and your employees and those things are, are obviously the most important things. The bad actors and the bad guys out there who are still doing the bad stuff are still doing their bad things in cybersecurity. And so there is a lot of misinformation going around, which we're trying to battle through education. Um, we're trying to help small businesses by picking up the, their load of cybersecurity worries or troubles, trying to trying to pick up that for them and, and deal with that for them while they can take care of some of their other business priorities. Um, and that's most of what we've been doing for the smaller businesses. And then of course the larger businesses, uh, they understand that they still need to worry about cybersecurity because they have the ability in the room to do so because they're larger organizations. But Typically those staffs are either under-resourced or undermanned, or there's something to that effect. They just need some extra help. And so we're there to support and, and plus up their cybersecurity, um, kind of enhance their response to that kind of thing. And so to close out my sort of long-winded answer is, it'll be interesting to see once the world goes back to normal in a few months or whenever that is, hopefully sooner than later, um, that It'll be interesting to see how businesses react to when they come back to work, if they've been affected by cybersecurity events or activities whatsoever, how they respond to that. And then what's the next thing you do? Because once the lights come back on and hopefully everything goes back to normal, if there's been a breach or if there's been some sort of activity that has occurred, you need to respond to that and now sort of what happens. And so there's, again, kind of like I started out with the, the whole answer was there's a lot of different ways to kind of view cybersecurity um, different ways to prioritize it, different ways to respond to it. And so we've been mainly focusing on how to articulate those different strategies and the different responses that businesses can take based on their size and their capability and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, mainly because I feel like I've seen a few different articles and I've also experienced a few different uh, suspicious emails over the past couple weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so, re you know, really, me knowing very probably enough about computers to turn them on. Um, <laughs> That's all I, you need. I, exactly. I, I'm just kind of wondering what what do you think are going to be common issues? Is it does it? And correct me if I'm wrong. This is how I understand it. But it, so mm -hmm. I'm on a computer that is company owned and provided for, uh, and it has its own levels of security. Let's say that I've clicked on something suspicious in between now and then. 
will it is it, am I currently potentially affecting everybody now, or is it once I get back to work that oh no, the servers are down or something? You know what? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it does. Yeah, and and ultimately. Everybody's favorite answer is it depends, right? It depends on your organization's security and the way you've architected that security. Because in some cases, your company-owned laptop may not be connected to a organization or a company network. Um, and so the only data that you're really compromising is the data that might be on the machine itself. But then if you are usually through a VPN of some kind, if you are connected to a company uh, network or a company database or something that to that effect, um, there's a chance that whatever malicious link or application you've run or whatever you've done could affect some sort of backend. Um, but ultimately, it, it really just depends how you've architected that. At the end of the day, as a general user of technology on any platform, you should just be aware that even outside of COVID, you should just be aware that there are bad actors out there and there are bad things that you can go to. If you're going through any random city, you just sort of know that maybe that's a bad area over there, just stay away. Same with the internet. There are bad areas of the internet, you just sort of stay away from. Um, you might get a, a suspicious email, just have your, have your own sort of personal defenses, your own sort of suspicions up about that. Don't click on any links you don't know uh, or don't trust. You know, if you get a weird email, think it's a weird email. If you get it from somebody whom you think you know, you can respond back and be like, hey, can I check or even call that person? Did you send me this email? Um, there are some steps you can take. But generally speaking, if you're a general user of technology, yep, just be aware that there are bad stuff out there. It's OK to be suspicious. Uh -huh. um, don't click on anything you don't know. Don't go anywhere you don't know. Don't run any programs or applications you don't know. And at the end of the day, have a trusted source of information or have a trusted provider, whether that's your grandson who's really good with tech because he's a nerd like I am, or if you have somebody like us and our team to call, call us and ask. We field those questions all the time from clients who literally just call and be like, hey, I just got this email. I kind of got a weird feeling about it. Can you help me sort of think through this? We do that all the time. And so if you are unsure, make sure you have somebody to reach out to. Yeah. And so, um, you know, kind of polling on the audience that we've had um, through, you know, very, we, we recently did a survey. So I, I'm actually pulling this directly from yeah. the participation in that. Um, a lot of the people that we serve are small businesses, uh, sometimes self-employed, um, but usually somewhere between the one and 10 employees, right? So the right. likelihood that they have a team uh, is pretty small, I, I guess you'd say. And, and really, I, I don't know how they would even know that something has happened until, I don't know, the, they can't log into their computer or something like that. So preemptively, you know, we get back to the offices. Is it sort of, a, is there a thing I can do to, you know, make sure we're, hey, we're all clean, sort of a kind of a computer COVID check, if you will, before we, before we get back to business or. Um, yeah. Now, one thing to note is there is a lot of snake oil out there too. Um, if you just Google like, I don't know, you, you could Google things like clean my computer. I wouldn't recommend you do that because what you're going to get are a lot of kind of sketchy websites or sketchy applications that might promise the world but not really do that. So be careful about that. Um, really, the best thing that you can do at the end of the day is keep your computer up to date. If there's a, a Microsoft Windows update that's been pestering you a lot about updating and it's like, do you want to restart? And you're like, no, I'm working. And it like keeps that. Take the time to just do it before you go to bed, restart the computer, make sure you update it with the updates that Microsoft sends you through Windows. Do that. Um, if you have any kind of password that you use, um, make sure that if you haven't changed it in a while, if it's a really old password, update that password. One really easy way to secure yourself and your accounts with a password, there's actually two. One is to use two-factor authentication. This means that like after putting in your password, it says, great, now put in a, a, a one-time code or a uh, temporary code to also access your account. It's called two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. If you're like Facebook or accounts or whatever they are, if they offer that security level, I'd recommend taking that. Uh, but the other thing you can do with passwords is a lot of times, unfortunately, in our industry, we 
force you to make really complex passwords with uppercase and lowercase and numbers and symbols to the point where you can't remember it anymore. Um, instead, really, if you just make a long password as opposed to a complex one, that's much uh, better practice for you because it's easier for you to remember and it's harder to crack. The complexity of a password isn't nearly as important as the length of the password. And so an easy way to do that is just to do a, a pass phrase. So if you say, um, my dog's name is, you know, Fido and I love him very much. That's a more or less easy phrase for you to remember. And it's super long. And so trying to break that password is, is computationally difficult. So when it comes to your accounts, how do you keep secure, have a password that works like that two factor authentication, if you can keep your windows up to date, including your browser. So if you're using Chrome or if you're using Firefox or something like that, make sure you're browser remains up to date. Um, those are really some of the, the easiest ways and frankly, some of the most powerful ways you can just keep yourself safe on a personal computer basis. Cool. And and let's say that, you know, this is the, this is truly a fire in that instance. Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, we are hacked, right? Yeah. What do I, what do, I do now? Do I, do I pay the ransom? Yeah. Do I, do I call Great somebody? Great question, <laughs> yeah. My, my, there's a few things you should do first. And the first thing you should do is not pay. Do not pay the ransom. Don't negotiate with them. Find an expert who can help you walk through that process. Depending on your size, you might have insurance that covers that. You might not. You need somebody to help you walk through that process. And here's why. Let's say, let's say you have ransomware in your computer. And ransomware, by the way, is where you might turn on your computer and instead of getting the screen you're used to, you get a screen that says your computer and all your files are locked unless you pay this person this amount of money via Bitcoin, let's say, and an email address. It's it's a very scary thing to see. Um, if you have something like that in ransomware, and let's say they're not asking for very much, and let's say you pay, right? What happens after that then is a few things. One, they may just take your money and run anyway. They may not unlock your files or give you your computer back. Um, they might give you your computer back, but then they're going to stay on your computer. And although they might tell you that they're gone and you may not know that they're still there because you've paid them once, they know you're, you can be a repeat customer, which means a year from now, six months from now, a month from now, they might just decide to lock your computer again because they know you'll pay again. And then you just become again, a, a repeat customer. Um, there's also lots of other things that they can do without getting into too much detail. Um, but Ransomware can be very complex and it can also be very simple. Somebody can be very malicious or not so much, but essentially what you should do is reach out to somebody you trust, some kind of provider. Again, if your insurance covers cases like that, that might be a good place to start um, or call, this isn't specific, specifically supposed to be an ad, but you can call us. We're happy to talk through the problem with you, happy to consult with you and figure out what's going on and what the right course of action is. Um, and, then, and then from there, we just sort of decide in some cases, we can get a hold of the computer and we can recover files or we can find out how to get around the ransomware. Um, in other cases, sometimes we have to bring in law enforcement with the FBI or something to that extreme to potentially negotiate with ransomware. Um, we've had that before. It's generally client decided though, the client sort of decides where and how they wanna respond to it. But yeah, ransomware can be very scary. There's lots of different ways to respond to it. The advice is don't pay, don't panic, reach out to somebody and let's figure that out. Yeah, kind of I, on a malicious end to it all, I feel like uh, ransomware as a, as a service is um, an interesting payment model, you know, or yeah. ransom as a subscription. No, you're is, right. Uh, yeah, and that, that's yeah. totally a thing. Ransomware is making a boatload of money. Not every every year it increases. I don't remember what the figures are, but it's it's some disgusting number that increases exponentially every year just because it's becoming easier to do it's becoming yeah. more widespread and yeah. people are paying because you know it when like i said when you get ransomware it's very scary you you want the files on your computer you want access back to your your environment or whatever it is and yeah. paying seems like the simplest option and so people just people pay sometimes in the millions of dollars people pay and and yeah, that's an unfortunate side effect. Yeah. One thing I guess I should shout out is um, uh, there are other services, uh, not just 
service consultancy firms like ours here in San Antonio, but locally too. Um, you have like a Jungle Disc is another local business I'm sure you heard of. Um, they, what they do, I'm going to butcher their sales pitch. So if anybody from their team ever watches this, I already, I apologize preemptively, but essentially what they do is they offer a backup service for your files so that when something bad does happen, you can regain access to your files right away. Um, that's something you can do preemptively if you have the budget and the time to be able to do something like that. So that if you're, when you are using your files and they're backed up somewhere else in the cloud, um, you can again, regain access to them most of the time if you have ransomware. You can do this yourself too with something like Google Drive or OneDrive or Box or Dropbox, or there's a bunch of different ones too. But if you're looking for more of a business solution to help you out and have that added layer of support, something like, like our firm or something like Jungle Disk, uh, are people you can reach out to and have that sort of expert conversation with. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I feel like that's uncommon knowledge for most business owners. Honestly, I don't even really understand what cybersecurity is. I mean, is it really, if you, if you type the name into Google, I feel like you get what looks like, uh, you know, drawings of missiles going places. Yeah, <laughs> big old targets everywhere and some clip Exactly, art. yeah, yeah. red yeah. versus blue. That's that's yeah. all I that's yeah. all I know. So, I mean, is there like a simple version of like, what does a cybersecurity guy do? I mean, I, it's not just typing at a computer, yeah. but it yeah. is, but it's not. So Cybersecurity is, is conceptually really simple and and the preconceived thoughts or concepts or notions you might already have about cybersecurity are probably pretty accurate, actually. Um, and my favorite analogy is a castle. Think about a medieval castle, right? And at the heart of your kingdom is that castle. And what lives in the castle is the most important thing in the kingdom, which is the king and queen, all their gold and the dragons and whatever else is in there, right? Everything important to you is in that castle. And everything you do around that castle is all about protecting the castle and what's inside. So what do you do? You ensure that the uh, there's a wall built around the castle. In this case, we might call that like a firewall, um, that the number of entrances into that wall are kept at a minimum, that they're guarded, right? And sometimes then we build a moat and it's about sort of layered defense or what we call defense in depth in order to make sure that if a bad person wants to get to the gold in the kingdom, well, they can't just walk right up and get it. They have to get through a number of layers of defenses that either prevent them entirely or more realistically, stop or slow them down to the point where the guards along the wall can find out what they're doing, find indicators that they're there, indicators that they're doing something bad, and then react to it. Uh, that's that's cybersecurity. Now, how we do that obviously can be very complex. It can be very uh, uh, technical in all the different tools and methods and things. Um, but at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. It's about layering defenses in different methods and methodologies in order to protect what is most valuable to you and your business, which could be your IP. It could be your customer data. Um, it could be access to your money. It could be a number of different things, but that's basically it. Okay. Uh, again, I feel like that's um, super valuable and sort of distilling it down for people that may be less familiar with. Um, yeah, and computers. I guess it's worth worth saying. So, if you do consult a cybersecurity firm, or if somebody is trying to sell you anything in cybersecurity, us included, what you are actually buying, hopefully, if they're a reputable source and a reputable vendor, whether it's a software tool or a service, what they ought to be doing is either helping you identify those defenses around your castle, helping you identify what those are in your environment, identifying areas where they're vulnerable, identifying areas where they're missing, help you build them or reinforce them. That's what it's all about is at the end of the day, reinforcing your defenses, either through identification or reinforcement or testing. You might hear the, the phrase penetration testing a lot. And what that is, is basically I'm gonna pretend that I'm a bad guy and I'm gonna try my best with all the knowledge and tools that I have to get through your castle wall, to get to your castle. And if I am successful in doing that, I'm gonna show you exactly how I did that so that then we can go back, work backwards and say, okay, I breached your outermost wall this way. And then I swam across the moat over here because there were no alligators. And then I went through the lasers this way or, or whatever in order to educate you about your defenses and then say, okay, great. Now, how do we reinforce that to make it even more difficult 
for a bad guy to come in. And so that's generally speaking what a cybersecurity service is supposed to do um, and then to help you do that. That's what you're that's what you're buying basically. That sounds very sounds very James Bondy. It can be, yeah. And, and yeah. to be perfectly honest, so the reason that we do what we do is because it's a lot of fun, frankly. Um, the, all the guys and gals on my team just really like what they do because it allows for them to kind of MacGyver their own sort of solutions or their own ways to to break into whatever it is they're trying to break into. You know, you think about maybe your favorite heist movie, like Ocean's Eleven or something. Um, you know, and they always have that that really cool like. They got the Mission Impossible of Titan music in the background. You see them breaking into the casino and getting to the vault and this and that. Um, it's not quite that sexy, unfortunately, um, but it does require that same level of creativity to get, eventually get into the vault. And that's why everybody on our team and everybody mostly in the industry like to do what they do is because it's just a lot of fun. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, one of the reasons that we really like what we do, and the reason it's a lot of fun is because we were doing an assessment for a major film studio and essentially they approached us and they said hey we're making all of these movies that aren't going to come out for years and years and years um we want to make sure that there's no possible way for somebody bad to come in and either steal the movie or show off what we've already made or tip off you know make public that we're making x y and z movie because you know we have very scheduled release dates and we have very scheduled you know surprises and all that kind of stuff um so we think we're really secure, but you guys come in and see if you can find to do anything, right? We, we're pretty sure you can't, but try anyway. And so we did. And so this engagement ended up being a lot of fun because at the end of the day, um, my guys were able to break in and what they found were the movies being made that aren't gonna be released for years from now, but they found them and I got to watch them because we're under NDA, we can't talk about it anyway. Um, but they got to watch them and see all the stuff in there. And it was a fun treasure hunt essentially for my guys that they had to work very hard for because this particular movie studio was was very uh, was very secure, but they did break in. So we were able to not only break in and that was a lot of fun, but it should also be said that at the end of the day, we also helped that movie studio be more secure because then we gave them our findings, showed them what it is we found and how we found it. And so we made them even more secure which makes the client happy. And so that's that's sort of a success story all the way around. My, my team had a lot of fun. The client ended up being more secure than they were. And that's that's a success story. Did they um, did they ask you for uh, early movie reviews as well? Or? We, we had a lot of fun in internal discussions about what we found, for sure. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Um, so I, I feel like the other element, I, we've been kind of thinking through, and, and maybe this isn't, Maybe this is the same, but yet it feels different. Um, sort of when I when I think of somebody hacking or yeah. you know security, I think of literally my my computer, the the box that I'm you know using right now. But uh, there's there's also so much business that's done in, uh, purely online through mm -hmm. web website uh, sales points and and stuff like that, Shopify or, or what have you. And I mean those. I don't know. I mean, like, what kind of, what do I, is that a thing I protect? I don't know. How does that fall within the boundaries of my stuff and protection? I mean, is there like McAfee yeah. for websites or something like that, that I, I don't know about, or is it more complicated than that? It's not necessarily more complicated, but it, it, it actually might even be more simple than you imagine. Um, going back to how do you secure your accounts, for example, whether that's an account on Shopify or your Facebook or your bank or whatever, yeah. Um, having that, having that long password, that's easy for you to remember, but, but long enough, that's difficult to crack computationally is a good practice to have. doesn't need to be complex necessarily, but the length will matter. Um, having that two factor authentication or multi-factor authentication that can help quite a bit. Um, but then also your delegation of permissions. And what I mean by that is let's say you have a Shopify account, right? and you might want to give everybody on your team access to the Shopify account. That's fine, except what level of permissions are you giving to everybody, right? Because if you have a team of 10 people and you give all 10 full admin access to your Shopify, well, what you've done then is you've essentially made 10 really large doors in your wall that's surrounding your castle. In this case, your castle is your Shopify information and account information, that kind of thing. So the wall that you built 
now has 10 really large doors because you've invited, you've given out 10 different ways for bad guys to get into your Shopify account via the 10 different accounts that you've given out to your team. So you have to consider, does everybody on my team really need access? And then if so, does everybody on my team need full access? A lot of these okay. different um, platforms and things offer different levels of permissions. So a, a lot of accounting software, for example, might allow you to bring in your accountant into your accounting software, but bring them in as a read only or a view only type user. So if someone were to, let's say, access your accounting software via your accountant's account, if they're a read only or view only, well, yeah, they might read your information and that's unfortunate that that's gotten out, but they wouldn't be able to affect anything else. And so permission delegation is important to understand who needs access, does everybody? If not, if so, how can we ensure that the, the minimum level of permissions are given, but nothing more than that? And so that would be something that you look at. If, if you have a team and they all have access to different pieces of information of your, of your business, see where you can sort of delegate that down. And the way we call that is we call it uh, either whitelisting or blacklisting. So if you are a, if you blacklist, what that means is you generally allow, and usually when we talk about blacklisting and whitelisting, what we talk about are um, for, sim for a simple example, let's say that your internet connection to your business allows any website. There is no filtering whatsoever because you're using a blacklist policy. Well, what that means is if you at first allow all the websites available and over time say, you know what, I don't like this website or I don't trust this website, so I'm going to blacklist it. And over time you sort of build up that blacklist to make sure that, they, that your users aren't going to certain websites. That's called blacklisting. That's one way to go about it. But the reverse is called whitelisting where you start off your network permissions by saying, you know what, no websites are allowed except for this one and this one, and that's it. And later on, as you conduct your business, you say, you know, we really need this one too. And okay, I'll add that to the whitelist, but no other websites, just these three, and then you add another one. And so when you talk about delegating permissions or delegating authority um, in terms of allowing traffic into your network, it can be whitelisting or blacklisting websites. You might even do this at home with your kids, honestly, and not realize it. Um, or if you're talking about access into a building or access into an account, just being mindful of who has access and what level of access is an important step to keeping those things secure online. Yeah, quite honestly, I feel like this is not something that you learn in business school or I don't even know if there's call it a cybersecurity business plan or any of that, you know, like where do I, where do I start or hey, if it's if it's down the road and your documents look like a dumpster fire, like mine do, um, you know, should I, is it just, did I mess up? Should I just call somebody like, um, you know, I, I that, that's kind of, I feel like you're adding so much stuff to my brain. It's like, <laughs> is so, it fixable at this point? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so when you talk about security in general, forget cybersecurity, right? If you just talk about security in general, again, we can go back to that castle analogy. Think about if somebody is in charge of securing that castle and they're told, okay, your job is to ensure that that castle is secure and nobody can get to it, go forth and go do good things. What is that person going to do? He's probably going to be overwhelmed too, right? Because he has at his disposal, he has a bunch of different tools that he could use. He's got trebuchets and he's got archers and he's got knights and he's got horses and he's got walls and moats and laser beams and he's got, you know, whatever else he's got, right? And that can be really overwhelming. Um, but the thing to keep in mind, especially for small businesses, is that your infrastructure probably doesn't require all of those things. You can use them all and we're happy to sell you all of them. But at the end of the day, you don't really need them all. What you need is a, a sensible strategy or a sensible approach to the size of your business and your operations. And so we might look at exactly what we've already talked about. We might start off very simply and say, how, where is your data stored? And you might say, well, Shopify and Squarespace and we use QuickBooks and uh, you know, we have a cash register, for example. Like, okay then what that means is what we're going to do is we're going to look at your password policy. We're going to look at your delegation of accounts and permissions. That's what we talked about. Um, we're going to make sure you have a lock on the door. We're going to make sure that that lock can't be easily broken into. 
we're going to might recommend you a lock or something to that effect. Um, but when it comes to something like whitelisting or blacklisting and that kind of thing, you know, if you have a small brick and mortar business and you have internet at your business, of course, but your internet, let's say is putting out Wi-Fi for everybody to connect to, we might say, you know, do you really need Wi-Fi at your business or better yet, can we restrict your Wi-Fi to only your employees? Because if you have a public Wi-Fi, that means anybody can connect to it. Do you need that? Are you a Starbucks? If you're not a Starbucks and you don't really need or any kind of coffee place or any kind of like food establishment, if you don't need everybody around to connect to your Wi-Fi, then that's one way we can secure you very easily is just by locking down your Wi-Fi and say only your employees can access it or something to that effect. So there are very simple steps that you can take to secure yourself. Um, steps that are entirely free. Um, if you, uh, well, I tell you, while we're talking, I'll bring up some resources for us uh, so that you can look at them uh, and reference them for yourself because you you don't need an expert necessarily to tell you these very simple things that you can find on the web. Um, it's just, again, it's being mindful of, as a business, what is most important to you? How are you securing that? And if you're not, how can you start? And so these are some simple ways. Yeah, that's, uh, man, you just have such a way with words, very articulate, um, which I appreciate. It really you helps just like to it down. Yeah, it must be. Honestly, that I think that's where, where it's at. So um, let me see. You, met, you brought up earlier something that I thought was really interesting because it's not a thing I think that most people would know about or think about. Um, you, you mentioned if if I get hacked, maybe my insurance might cover it. Is that a is that a common thing? Do people just have hack insurance, or can you insure me if I am a hack? Or um... yeah, so so there. I want to be a little bit careful here. So there is cybersecurity insurance. Um, some of it is not great. Some of it is. Some of it's not great because just like in other insurance, um, it you get what you pay for, and the fine print kind of matters. And I'm I'm not an insurance expert. I'm not an insurance agent. I, I'm, I'm not sort of the general disclaimer there. Um, larger businesses generally have um, like uh, uh, errors and emissions, or they'll have their general liability. They'll have different levels and layers of business insurance that they have. It may include some level of cybersecurity. Uh, provisions or cybersecurity uh, portions in that. But if you have, let's say, general liability and you're curious if there is cybersecurity in there, I would ask your insurance provider to explain to you in common English in regular terms what it actually covers and give me examples of scenarios that it would cover or would not cover. Um, because a lot of times what they cover is not what you expect. Again, like, like most insurance. Um, and so, so I would call your insurance provider and I would ask if, if your general liability or whatever it is that you have includes provisions for cybersecurity or uh, cyber hacks or whatever terminology they use. Um, yeah, I, I would confer with them and then see if you're an online business, if you do a lot of, um, if you do a lot of online transactions or if you have different locations with Wi-Fi, or if you think that that's something that you were specifically vulnerable to, um, I would speak to them about that. Okay. Yeah, that, that's super helpful. Um, it just, I I'd never really thought of it or, or heard of it before. And so I didn't know if that was like a common thing people had in insurance or business. Yeah, it's um, becoming you know, more, sure. more common. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's common yet. It's be, and, and the reason is because for insurers, it's, it's very hard right now anyway for insurers to sell cybersecurity insurance because there's an education sort of curve there trying to educate business owners about why they might need it or, or even care. But then on the other end, it's also yeah. for insurers to sell cybersecurity insurance because it's difficult to measure risk. Um, it, you know, insurance is all about risk mitigation, right? And so trying for, for yeah. an insurance agency, uh, they'll be happy to sell you any kind of policy you want, of course, but uh, in drafting that policy, it's difficult for them to, to really see, okay, from a cybersecurity point of view, how vulnerable are you? You know, are you taking certain steps? Are you not? Right. Um, some insurers will take the steps to evaluate you before they they draft the policy, and some won't. And so, it, your mileage may vary. Is ultimately kind of the, the bottom line there. Hmm. Very interesting. Do you um, want to talk about well, I mean, I feel like an I've example. 
I don't, I mean, no, that's fine. We can leave them out. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully they yeah. aren't watching us. Just leave them out. I tried. Yeah, I don't tried. think they, yeah. <laughs> can leave them out. I don't know that they're up and running yet, but um, I just meant in general, I didn't really understand the concepts of yeah. what would even be insured. Or, yeah, um, now, now the reason, the reason you might come, and again, this isn't supposed to be an ad necessarily, but the reason you might come to a firm like ours or talk to our experts or or others like us prior to something bad happening is because once something bad does happen, even if your insurance covers it, it can be very painful to experience to go through. It can be very expensive. It can be very, very emotionally draining. Having ransomware on your on your system or for your business to be locked out of your files or anything like that can be just a horrendous thing to go through as a business owner. And so you may not think that you're susceptible or you may not think you're of the size that matters or you may not think that, you know, oh, why would they come attack me? You know, what? what do I, I'm a little shop that does, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. You're, you're rolling the dice essentially. And we we're very careful not to sell our services or sell cybersecurity just strictly based on fear. I, I, I think that's a horrible sales tactic and I, I, we don't do that whatsoever. Um, but there is something to be said for educating yourself about the cyber threats that are out there. And unfortunately what the numbers say is that, um, more than a half of small businesses will experience some level of cybersecurity event and some level of those, something like 30%, it might even be higher than that, uh, will go out of business because of it. And that's, that's terrifying. It's very scary. And so while you may not think that you're susceptible and you know, why would you be a target and you don't want to spend the money it might take to bring in an expert like us to come see how vulnerable or not you are, the, the, the other side of that equation is that if you roll the dice and you wait and something bad does happen, it's going to be a whole lot more expensive and it's going to be a whole lot more time consuming for you to come back from that than it is for you to defend yourself and be proactive against it. And that's hmm. that's our sale. That's essentially our sales pitch in our conversations with a lot of small businesses because we get that a lot. We understand if you're a small business, why why would somebody else on the other side of the planet try and target you for some money like that that doesn't make sense why would that happen but the the reality is that it does it happens all the time it happens every day especially right now during a crisis when nobody's really paying attention and so what we what we're trying to express is that trying to be proactive about it there are easy and simple and affordable ways to be proactive about your cybersecurity than it is to try and come back from that in an expensive time consuming manner yeah yeah, I mean, the way that you describe it, I would feel that there would be billboards, you know, call the twos kind of thing, yeah. you know, have yeah. you been hacked? Maybe that's something we should do. Yeah, P completely possible. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's, it just feels, you know, I, I, it's happening so frequent that it, it seems like um, maybe there's an awareness uh, issue in general that pe people have. I mean, so so speaking of awareness of being hacked, uh, I don't know if you, I'm sure that you have heard of this particular site. I have been pwned or have I been mm -hmm. pwned or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean like, you know, is that, is that a worthy, what do you think of those things? You, you think sure. I should drop my email in there and be like, where, where has this, uh, where have I gone wrong? Which sites have I traversed yeah, uh, incorrectly or have, you know, misconstrued my data somewhere? Yeah. Now like typical disclaimer, like I, I, I caution against just sort of dropping, any information whatsoever, sort of just anywhere on the web. Um, but yeah, a website like that, like have I been pwned? Um, PWN, did they even put the E in there? I don't know. PWNED is probably how they spell it. I don't know. Um, actually, It's a good question. I just, but, if uh, you misspell it in Google, it, it'll figure it out. It'll just, yeah, it'll just give you the right thing. Yeah. Um, but essentially what we're talking about it is a website wherein um, have I been pwned? Is a, is a website that tries to tell you whether or not you your email or your account or your passwords have been leaked. So in the news over the last, let's say five years or so, you may have seen um, headlines, you may have seen stories or articles that talked about um, major organizations that have been hacked where passwords were either stolen or released or information has been stolen or released. Um, you may have seen that happen a number of times in a number of different places. Uh, and essentially what that does is the the bad guys out there create whole libraries of hundreds of thousands or millions of passwords that they have stolen from the internet. And what they try to do with these libraries of passwords is say, well, 
if I'm trying to get into somebody's account, let me use this library of a million or so passwords that I already know people have used because I've taken them from real world examples. Let me try these first. And inevitably, some of them may or may not work. If you've not changed your password in a while, and we recommend that you do, this is why. It's because passwords get stolen all the time. And, and so if, it, if your password has been stolen, somebody's gonna try and use it somewhere with your email. And so if you put your email on one of these websites like Have It Been Pwned, it'll say your email was found in such and such database that was hacked on such and such time, and your password may or may not have been taken. We recommend you change it. This is why this is why you hear like um, you know change your password every two weeks or every thirty days oh, or ninety God. days or you hear all <laughs> kinds of noises like that and they're irritating right they're annoying because you might have a password you might even have a long passphrase like I talked about um, and you remember it and it's working just fine and you're secure and you're doing great and then thirty days later it's like we have to change it now and and that's totally it's irritating it's annoying completely understand but this is why we security experts advocate for that is because passwords get stolen all the time. And when they do, somebody will try to use them. And now is probably a good time to also talk about one of the ways that you can secure yourself is using a password manager. So this is not sponsored, but we use LastPass. Um, LastPass is a good one. One password, Dashlane is another good one. But what these do is they will automatically generate a password for you. They'll automatically generate long or complex or both passwords for you and then they'll save them for you. So all you have to remember is your master password for your LastPass or your Dashlane or whatever it is. And all the rest of your accounts all have separate passwords all on their own. If they need to get updated, the password manager will either do it for you or just a couple of clicks away. And so password managers, if you have a lot of passwords, a lot of accounts, you don't wanna deal with managing all of that because it can be a lot. Password managers are a great way to help you do that. Um, more and more organizations are requiring them simply because they help keep people secure in an easy way to do that uh, is using password manager. Interesting. Yeah, so I, I should probably uh, get rid of all my sticky notes. You're saying that's not a common- All, all the sticky notes that are like pasted around your yeah. uh, your screen there, yeah. Yeah, so so my, my password is password is a bad password. It's a bad password, yeah. Yeah, the, mo the most common passwords are the ones you might expect. It's password, it's password one, two, three, it's password with numbers instead of letters, every kind of little combination you can think of there. Um, uh, the most common passwords are like, I love you or let me in or uh, something to that effect. Um, in fact, if you, if you do Google, if you go 10 most common passwords, you'll, you'll see them. Um, if, if you see your password in that list, please change it. Change it to literally anything else. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you take nothing else away from this, just just have a have a good password, enable two factor, use a uh, password manager if you can. Those are good ways to to help do that. I dig it. So I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about cybersecurity. Hopefully, at, I know. At a I was hoping we talk about video games, but uh, that's, that's fine. Oh well, yeah, and that's where I was gonna lead. So in this, I'm sure your I'm sure your audience wants to hear me ramble on about video games. Yeah, really. Um, as we as we started the conversation prior to the recording, um, we were we were talking about what we've been doing to really, I guess, suffice our brain, you know, yeah. keep keep us preoccupied while everything else is going on. And I know that you're an avid gamer to some degree, um, I believe. I don't know if that's the correct. I mean, your chair looks very game like. So you, you've, you've <laughs> added you've ratted me out. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what, you know, really, what have you been doing? What do you think is even relevant to do right now during this whole, call it crisis, if you will? Yeah. It, well, if you have the opportunity or the luxury of staying at home, um, in my my humble opinion, me and my little room here, um, the, the best thing you can do right now is, is education. And that's what I've been doing is, is in my daily routine, what I've built in are anywhere between an hour or two of education time where I'm learning something not necessarily new. I'm not learning a new skill like juggling or something. That's not really what I'm doing, but I'm trying to enhance my education on just different areas that I'm interested in and different things that I think will benefit us as a team and as a business. Um, if, again, if, if you have the luxury and that, that's one thing that we're, we're, 
uh, very appreciative of, of having the luxury to work from home. We worked from home even before the COVID crisis. Um, we all work from home, um, and which is which we're very thankful for. And, and we we realize like what a what a huge benefit that is for us. Um, yeah, education is really the the new thing that we've been doing is ensuring that we're learning something new or that we're maintaining levels of awareness of different things in the industry and those kinds of things. So, you know, when you work from home, how do you, I think, and a lot of people are struggling with this right now and you'll see various different new apps that are uh, coming out to maybe mm -hmm. sort of address this to some degree, but how do you yeah. find connectivity with your team uh, yeah. or even camaraderie? How do you build that when literally all it's you hard. have is a computer? Yeah. yeah, it's really, really hard. So a little bit of background on me. Um, one of the reasons that I started this company and one of the reasons that we all work remotely is because at the age of like 25, I had the horrible misfortune of working from home. Um, and it was telling a 25 year old like, Hey, you can work from home at your own, on your own hours, making a decent salary. That's fine. Um, especially for an introvert like me, that was the greatest gift ever. Um, and, and after about a year or two of doing that, um, that project ended and I had to go back to a nine to five in an office. Um, and I didn't want to do that anymore, go figure. Um, and so I wanted to find a way to work from home. So fast forward, we started the company, we decided to go remote, one to keep costs down to be a lean business, but also frankly, just so I could work from home. Um, and while all that's great, and I love working from home and I wouldn't change it for the world, that, that's just me and that's how I work. Um, there are a lot of challenges. It's very, very hard to maintain certain levels of communication throughout the team, to maintain levels of camaraderie, like you said, to build that um, that re that rapport, to uh, ensure that everybody's on the same page, we're all talking the same language, that we're all operating the same way. It's very hard, and there are plenty of days, especially recently, plenty of days that I wish that I could just herd all the cats into one building or one room and just be like, "Look, guys, here's." how it is, here's what you need to know. Let's just all work from this one room today just to be on the same page. Like there are tons of dev days that I, I wish that we could do that because it'd be so much simpler if we could just, hey, Bob, this or that, or, or hey, did you know that? And, and because you don't necessarily have that, like sure, you can just text right away. It's not quite the same thing. Um, anyway, I guess I'm venting now, but yeah, it, it is very hard. Um, but so one of the ways we combat that, and one of the ways that that we try to build that is we have biweekly meetings. Um, we ensure that everybody talks to everybody else on a regular basis. Um, we have different checks and balances in our process to make sure that there are different levels of review for QA and QC of our reports and our deliverables and those kinds of things to make sure that the whole team is involved. Um, and then we also have a lot of events now obviously not anymore with covid but we try throughout the year of a normal year we try to go to events together so that we we all do get together every so often throughout the year just to kind of have that face to face and, and those kinds of things but but yeah no you're right it's it's very challenging it's it's very cost effective but it's also very challenging so when you say events you mean like conferences or do you mean like yeah. bowling oh, okay yeah no no you, you won't ever see me out on on the lanes <laughs> uh, maybe the bar, not so much the lanes, but no, yeah, we will go to conferences and stuff, uh, cybersecurity conferences, which I'm sure sound incredibly fun, but yeah. uh, we'll go to conferences and hang out and kind of have that face to face and, and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing we find too is of course, not everybody works well from home. We've had plenty of, of folks come through the team, um, really, really good uh, individuals, really technically savvy, just decent human beings have come through the team. Um, and we would love to have kept them on the team, but some people just realize they don't work well from home. They, they need to get out of the house because there are either lots of distractions or they just don't work well in their home environment. They need to be in an office or something to that effect. And there's nothing right or wrong or indifferent about that. Some people just work differently. Uh, and, and so one of the things that we've grown to learn is as we field new recruits or field new applicants onto the team, we have a very long conversation about working from home, whether that person thinks they can, whether the person ever has, um, whether they're able to sort of self-guide and self-motivate themselves. Uh, it, it's a big part of our hiring process because, again, the lesson learned from us is that we've had really good folks come through that just didn't work well from home and so unfortunately just weren't a good fit. Um, and so that's, yeah, that, that's just one of the things we've learned and part of the challenge of working from home. Hmm. And, um... 
Well, so you talked about spending time with education. Have you built that within your team that they should also be doing that? Or is it still sort of free form in terms of what yeah. they, they should be doing right now? Yeah, it's it's certainly free form. Um, I'm not a fan of micromanaging um, at all. So it, it's how people use their time is is on them. Um, and it, like if they, if they just want to play video games, like that's to just veg out. That's totally fine. We certainly don't micromanage people's days whatsoever. Um, and that's another challenge too with working from home is if you work from home, it means you're also never very far from work. And so we have to be um, resistant to the impulse to just be like, oh, this email came in or oh, this thing came up we had to do. Let me let me just let me just very quickly let me just text Rob about we have to try not to do that, especially off hours because we have to be respectful of people's time. Yes, we know that they're home. Yes, we could just text them. It's they may not text back that beside the point, the point is being respectful of people's time and people's space. Um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, so, so we're res respectful of people's time and space that way. And so we don't micromanage, they're gonna kind of just do whatever they want. But to answer your question about education, we certainly are huge proponents of education. Training and education is a huge, um, a huge value add for the team. And so we're very encouraging of that, which is why here in the company, if anybody wants to learn something new, wants to take a class or buy a book or enhance their their skills or capabilities in any way, we'll pay for it in the company. Um, and uh, and we do that again to encourage people to do, to do that because we think it's important for personal growth, for career and, and professional growth. Um, and then also of course it benefits the team. So we, we have those education funds set aside specifically for that. Is that, is there like, um, I guess if you were recommending a place to go get education at this point. I mean, like, is it like you, you to me, or is it, uh, you know, should you sign up yeah. for Harvard business education online or, uh, um, you, you know, where should I, yeah, get yeah, yeah. Uh, to be master so to be class or, <laughs> um, uh, if you want to learn something new, just go to YouTube. Like, yes, you, you can sign up for master class or you can sign up for, um, a college course, or you can sign up for any number of those things you can find online. And some are going to be great. Some are going to be good. Some are not going to be so, so hot. Um, and YouTube kind of falls everywhere on that spectrum. You know, certainly if you want to learn something new, you'll find videos on YouTube that are bad, but you also find ones that are good. But at the end of the day, if you want to learn something new, it's literally as easy as just typing it into YouTube and finding a video on it because it exists out there somewhere. Um, and you don't have to pay thousands of dollars for something like that. Uh, and, and yeah, so one of the things that I've been doing recently actually is I'm currently enrolled into um, Professor Scott Galloway's Sprint. Um, professor Scott Galloway is a professor of marketing and strategy. Um, he's, he's pretty well known sort of in the Twitter space, uh, the Twitterverse and a few other areas. Um, you might see him on like MSNBC talking about the economy and things like that. Anyway, he's got a Sprint and one of his sort of things he talks about is he, he sort of rallies against the idea that higher quality or even just higher postgrad education should be expensive and exclusive. And so what he's done is he's taken the best parts of his curriculum and he says, for 500 bucks, you get two weeks of my time and my knowledge to just go through a sprint. It's called, that's why it's called a sprint because it's only two weeks um, to kind of go through marketing and strategy and that kind of thing. And so that's a class that I've been going through th this week and last week, uh, which has been great. And so, you know, if, if $500 is outside of your budget, again, there's plenty of that kind of stuff on YouTube for completely free. Um, but there are things, you know, in the, in the affordable range and whatever it is you're looking for, it's out there. Um, but, yeah, but, but really though, like, don't be afraid just to go to YouTube and look for it. Cause, uh, man, there's so much stuff out there for you to learn. It's so much good stuff. Go look there first. Okay. I dig it. Um, so are you I don't know if this is, uh, I don't mean this to be jokey, but I mean, what's the likelihood that I become a cybersecurity expert through YouTube? Is it, you think that's a thing I could do? Um, you, Ryan, um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, there is a lot, there's certainly a lot you can learn. Um, would you become a cybersecurity expert? No, I would say no, because it takes a lot of, um, it takes a little bit more than watching a video. Um, you know, if you want to learn juggling, you can watch a video on that. You want to learn a dance, you can watch a video on how to do the steps for the dance. Um, cybersecurity takes a little bit more hands-on, um, but that's not to say that it's it's difficult. It's it's not difficult. 
you can get into it. It takes a little bit more effort. And so one of the recommendations that we give to people who want to get into cybersecurity all the time is we say, build your own range. And what we mean by that is build your own, build yourself your own, let's say home network that you can practice against to hack into or crack into or, or penetrate or just do a vulnerability assessment on. And that can be very simple and it can be very affordable. Um, for any of you tech nerds out there, you can go buy like, let's say a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is a $30 tiny microcomputer that's super powerful. You build a whole network off of that if you want to. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you're building your own test kingdom, we refer to as a range. You're building your own little test kingdom and you say, okay, I've built my test kingdom. I've built my castle and my walls and whatever else. Now let me try to break into it. How, how do I now break into the security that I just made? And by doing that over and over again, and this is where you can go to YouTube and say, okay, I'm trying to break into this firewall. How do I do that? And you'll find videos on that all the time. Um, and you just learn different techniques, learn different methodologies. Um, and over time through practice, and this is why the video alone isn't, isn't um, the video alone isn't enough. You also kind of need that sort of hands-on. Um, but again, very easily accessible. Um, if that's your jam, reach out to us. We're happy to help you and give you some recommendations. Um, but that's it, yeah. One yeah. of one of the misconceptions I want to kind of like dis like like disprove or or speak against is the fact that cybersecurity is complicated or or difficult necessarily. Um, it can be certainly. You know, one of our, some of our our larger enterprise level clients with with global networks trying to secure that is very difficult it takes a lot of technical expertise um, but if you're just trying to understand and you want to get into the field don't be scared don't be uh, intimidated there's no reason to be plenty of people out there on twitter uh, and youtube and everywhere else are more than happy to help you just reach out awesome yeah i feel like uh well this has been this has been really fun in terms of education for me i feel like i've learned more sure. and um, more than reading a book, which I'm very bad at. So, um, Me what, too. I've That's is, you. <laughs> what I've learned is that, uh, the, the files do exist in the computer as they showed in Zoolander. There you go. You got um, it. Um, you just got to break it open. So that's right. They're, they're just, they're in there. What kind of computer do you have? It's black. It's got some lights on it. I think the files are in there. Uh, exactly. Uh, well, anyway, Michael, I, I really appreciate you sharing your, fresh perspectives today. Um, I hope it was helpful. I hope it was valuable to somebody. Oh, I'm sure that it will be for sure. Um, that's not, that's never been a thing. Value is inherent in the, the watch or the listen. So um, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, do you have, uh, what's the best way, I guess, would be to. Yeah, connect. absolutely. If you, if you want to get a hold of me personally, um, you can tweet at me. I'm at Pleasant M L P L E A S A N T M L. It's my last name. Uh, and uh, Michael, anyway, you get it. Um, the other way to, to get uh, to either me or the company and our team is through our website. Just go to opensecurity.com or opensecurity.io. And there's a little contact us form on there. Send us a message. We'll be happy to get right back to you. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you spending the time this morning. Uh, I'm sure that you have many of other things work related to, to get to you after this. Definitely, but, definitely not video games for sure. Not video games. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause you've run a really strict environment at work. So that's right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Uh, I dig it. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, end the recording and I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks Ryan.